This video is brought to you by Ellen Chrome, different by design. I want to give you my disclosures up front. Ellen Chrome did, of course, pay me to make this video today featuring their flagship Octabox, the 190 centimeter, 75 inch indirect light motif Octa Softbox. After I spend about three minutes going over the strengths of this modifier, I'm going to break down five ways that you can use large Octaboxes in your work, regardless of the brand. However, I really love this modifier and I do think that it's quite special, and you might even say legendary. That's how I, along with many photographers, would describe this Octa. If you study behind the scenes images from the world's top photographers and in my feed as well, regardless of the brands of lights that those photographers use, you'll see this modifier popping up everywhere. And you can rent one from almost every equipment rental house. And the reason why is simple. The light from this modifier is nothing short of beautiful. I bought one in 2015 and it was a game changer. At the time I was using another brand of lights and their 150 centimeter Octabox just didn't cut it. For the first time in my life I felt like I had the ability to truly recreate window light. That's why I recommend the softbox time and time again. And if you don't use Allen Chrome lights you can adapt it to almost any brand with a simple adapter. Simulating window light, though, isn't all this modifier can do. Indirect means that the light points away from the subject, allowing you to take off the outer diffusion and use the modifier like a giant silver reflector. The light that it produces is high in contrast, yet soft due to its large size. You can use it whenever you want the feeling of sunlight, but with more pleasing skin texture. Now that I've shared with you the strengths of this modifier, I want to share with you five different ways that you can use it. You can use it to produce Rembrandt lighting, sky lighting, short lighting, rim lighting, and high contrast direct lighting. Rembrandt lighting involves positioning the light to the side of the subject so that it casts a shadow from their nose that stretches across their face and connects with the shadow on the other side of their head opposite of the light. When you do this correctly, an upside down triangle of light will be visible beneath the eye farthest from the modifier. This technique is named after the Dutch painter Rembrandt who often had his subjects angled slightly towards a window. So to pull off this lighting, you'll want to place your modifier to the left or right of your subject and have it almost perpendicular to them, but a little bit in front of them. This softbox does have the ability to achieve this lighting pattern, but positioning it too close to the subject may result in the light wrapping around the nose, or they might turn towards the light while posing, which some would argue is actually loop lighting and not Rembrandt lighting. But let's not worry about that. Let's just focus on the technique. It's really about what you're intending to create. And if it's slightly different, it's okay. When you place this modifier close to your subject, the light looks like window light on an overcast day. I will typically place it so that the far side of the modifier's face is slightly in front of their nose. To get the softest light possible, many would argue that you should feather this modifier so that it's pointed in front of your subject, not directly at them. The analogy you often hear is that light comes out of your modifier like a fire hose, and if you point it right at the person, it's going to be harsher, but if you point it in front of them, it's going to miss them with light. I do believe this to be generally true and I have seen it in action before, but I ran a test with this modifier recently and found that feathering the light only affects the brightness of the backdrop, but the fact that the model is wearing matte makeup may have been a factor in this test. There is slightly more shadow detail in the feathered image, so technically there is less contrast, but it doesn't seem to be making a substantial difference. The second thing that you want to consider is that you have the bottom of the softbox at jaw level, so the shadows go down. If it's too low, the light may start to come from below, which will start to feel spooky and unnatural. I ended up feathering the light on this shot because I wanted the background to go dark. The light from this modifier, when observed on his face, metered at f11, and I set my camera to f11. 
And one more note, when you're using a light meter, you want to hold that meter, and I'll use my phone right now instead of a meter, but you want to hold that meter as close to the person's face uh, as possible um, because it will be a lot more accurate in metering the light. If I move this closer to the light, it might be a stop brighter. And then if I set my camera to the f-stop that the light meter told me, uh, then I'd end up underexposing my photo by a full stop, and that wouldn't be very good. So just remember, because of the inverse square law, you want to keep the meter like very close to the person and not farther away. I know at first when you're starting out, it feels a little uncomfortable that you're shoving this thing in someone's face. I, I, I know how that feels, but you're just going to have to get over it because if you hold it out here, it's just not going to be the same. So really, that's just a good practice that you should always do uh, when using a meter. I also noticed uh, in this particular shoot that his hair was blending into the background. So I added an Ellen Chrome 35 by 100 centimeter, that's 14 by 39 inch, Rotolux strip softbox over the set in uh, the, sort of in the back, but really top down. When adding a hair light in this position, you wanna make sure that you are adding just enough light to bring out the details, but if you add too much light, you may end up creating a highlight on the nose. So if you add a light in this position, just be careful. I will often use a light like this when I don't want the hair light to be obvious or if the subject's hair is um, really shiny. Or in this case, if it's big and, and curly and there's a lot of volume to it. Uh, the reason why is if you put it in the back, it tends to make a halo and an outline and make the hair look rather frizzy. Uh, but when you come from the top down, it preserves those details and gets you the separation uh, that you're looking for. When I meter the light from this modifier, it metered at f5.6. Here's a comparison with only the main light on the left, the hair light in the middle, and then you can see both of them firing in the image on the right. So the two images on the left and center are adding together to create our final exposure. As you can see, the light from this modifier looks great, and that's why I love this softbox. I often pair it with the 35 by 100 centimeter strip softbox, and you can typically find me on set using multiple Ellen Chrome softboxes at once, including the Rotolux Deep Octo 100 and the Rotolux Deep Octo 70. Those are 39 and 27.5 inches, respectively. And I also like to use the Rotolux Deep Octobox uh, 150, that's 59 inches, and the Light Motive 120. They're all really great soft boxes. Before I switched to Ellen Chrome, I had an assortment of modifiers from different companies, and my lighting was all over the place because some of the soft boxes were old and yellowed, and some of them were new and from cheap manufacturers, and they produced warm light and cool light, and it just wasn't good. But once I fully switched over to Ellen Chrome, I got really consistent results because all of my modifiers matched. Plus, the light that comes out of these soft boxes is really even edge to edge, and that's something that you don't find with every brand. So no matter what you're shooting, Ellen Chrome has a soft box for you, and they make speed rings for almost every brand of lights. So check out their entire line of soft boxes today at ellenchrome.com. When you light your subject generally from the far side of the set and have them turn to the same side, the resulting lighting pattern is called short lighting. When you create short lighting, you can also create Rembrandt lighting at the same time. In this example, featuring our models Zach and Maya, I positioned the 190 centimeter octobox almost even with the backdrop and then directed it towards the camera. The light outlined their bodies on camera left and then bounced off of the ceiling and the floor, filling in the shadows. When you're shooting in the studio, you will typically set your camera to your camera's sync speed. This is typically 1 200th of a second, but can vary depending on your camera. When you take a photo with flash, there is a brief and singular burst of light, which I like to refer to as traditional flash. Because this pulse is often the only light significantly contributing to your photos, the speed of the burst stops the movement in your frame rather than the shutter speed. We'll drill down on this in a little bit. 
Well, high speed sync allows you to shoot above the sync speed of your camera, it often results in lower overall light brightness, higher ISOs, or reduced depth of field when compared to traditional flash. The reason why this happens is because when you exceed your sync speed, you're causing your light to go into high speed sync mode, and that tells your flash to divide the total volume of light that it's capable of producing in one pulse into a bunch of little pulses that go off as your sensor records the image from the top to the bottom or one side to the other, depending on your camera's orientation. The amount of time that it takes for the flash to discharge its volume of light is referred to as the flash duration. By reducing the power settings of most lights, be sure to check your manual, you can shorten the flash duration because your flash will fire faster when it has less light to discharge. Elenchrome shows the flash duration on the back LCD panel of their lights, usually in T.1. T.1 is the amount of time it takes for your flash to go from zero to maximum brightness and then back to 10%, whereas T.5 is when your flash goes from zero to 100 and then back to 50, which doesn't really tell you the information that you need to know in this instance. All of the light that comes out of your flash while the shutter is open adds up to create the exposure. Put another way, the brightness of our final image is not determined by the brightness of the peak output of the flash, but the sum of all of the light discharged during the exposure. To freeze people in motion, you'll typically want a flash duration to be around T.1, 1 3,000th of a second or shorter. So turn the flash down accordingly and watch the LCD or consult your manual for more information if needed. Most brands of lights have a flash duration mode where they prioritize flash duration over color temperature stability. In addition, when you shift from full power on most lights to minimum power, the color temperature of your light will become cooler. And this difference is less in standard mode and it's more in the shorter flash duration mode, which Ellen Chrome calls action. Just be aware that there will likely be a trade-off if you use the shorter flash duration mode. If you're using multiple lights in one scene and one of them appears blue and one of them appears yellow, this is probably the reason why it's happening. If you come across this issue, Make sure you aren't using multiple lights in one setup at wildly different power settings and make adjustments so that your lights can be at similar power levels. You might need to move one further away or closer or add a different uh, softbox instead of a reflector or something like that. In addition, the light in your scene with the longest flash duration will probably determine the amount of movement recorded in your shot. The next thing you need to do in order to stop movement is to have your flash significantly brighter than the light in the room. This will ensure that the only light contributing to your shots is the flash. So dial in your exposure with flash first, either using a light meter or trial and error, and then take a photo without flash at those settings. If your frame is substantially blank, then you're good to go. This typically happens when the ambient light is about two to four stops darker than your flash. If the light in the room is too close to the brightness of your flash, you are going to get ghosting on your subject's hands and feet. So if this happens, reduce the amount of ambient light in the room by closing the drapes or turning off really bright overhead lights. Likely it won't be the overhead lights, it'll be the window light coming in, but just keep that in mind. And if this went right over your head, don't worry. It's a complicated concept and I have a whole video about flash duration, which I will link to. Okay, let's put all this theory to use. For these images featuring Zach and Maya, I set my Ellen Chrome 5 to action mode and reduced the power to 3.1, resulting in a flash duration of 1 3270th of a second. My camera settings were 1 200th of a second at f8 at ISO 400. Then I took a photo without flash to ensure that the image was essentially black, which confirmed that the ambient light in the room wasn't having a significant impact on my photos. As you can see, every part of this frame is perfectly frozen. 
I don't know if anyone else uses the term skylighting, so I might have just made this up. This lighting pattern is close to butterfly lighting, but it doesn't have to be in line with the camera. It's basically when you boom a light over the set to simulate light coming from a skylight. When using this lighting setup, there are a few things to keep in mind. First, be cautious of ceiling fans. Second, avoid placing any part of your subject's body too close to the softbox, like their hands, because they will end up being way brighter than their feet, and then you'll have to try to fix it in post. That's why when I am go into a setup like this, I try to keep my subject at least two feet or 60 centimeters from the softbox. Due to the inverse square lamp, this will result in more even lighting head to toe. If you have a ceiling height of three meters or 10 feet or higher, it can be a beautiful way to utilize this modifier. But if you have eight foot ceilings or 2.4 meter ceilings, it's probably not going to work out. So don't try this at home, literally. For this image of Zach and Maya, I boomed the light over my set from camera right, and then I used a C stand and a grip arm on camera left to tilt the side of the Octobox furthest from the camera upwards. I did this to lighten the backdrop and increase the likelihood that my subject's eyes would have a catch light. Then I positioned the dancers so that they were generally in line with the C stand. For this image of Colleen, I positioned the 190 centimeter Okta overhead and added a Moll Richardson 407, which is an old fashioned continuous Fresnel light fixture, which had a 300 watt incandescent bulb inside. It essentially acted as a prop because this light wasn't really bright enough to have a huge impact on my photo. To make it look like this light was actually doing something, I added a light with a grid reflector and a CTO gel just offset on camera right. I used the CTO gel so that the light would mimic the light from this vintage Fresnel. Instead of adding this uh, light, I could have dimmed the other lights and increased my ISO, which would have increased the impact of the vintage Fresnel on my scene, but that would have decreased my overall image quality. To prevent lens flare from the light with the grid reflector and the CTO gel, I used a 50 by 75 centimeter or 20 by 30 inch piece of foam core to flag my lens. I also positioned a Rotolux strip softbox that's 35 by 100 centimeters or 14 by 39 inches with a grid on a boom and used it for my hair light. If I didn't have the grid, the light would have likely spilled onto the matching canvas gravity backdrops and that would have been overall distracting. I just wanted to make sure that that light went to her and nowhere else. Here you can see test frames with the Fresnel with the hair light, the Fresnel with the grid reflector, the Fresnel with the main light, and then all of the lights together. Then after probably moving the main light slightly to the right, I ended up with the light in the final image. Rim lighting is when you place a light behind your subject, creating an outline all around their body. To execute this setup with Dyron, I maneuvered the giant 190 centimeter Okta to the rear of the set and aimed it towards the camera. Then I leaned a one meter or 39 inch wide V-flat world V-flat against its face and then positioned the subject between the modifier and the camera. This configuration effectively transformed my single light source into three strip softboxes. If I were using a 150 centimeter or five foot softbox, it wouldn't have been big enough to pull this off because too little of the white surface would have been visible. In situations where I only had a 150 centimeter octabox on hand, I added a strip box to the side in order to get the same look. Now this wasn't very efficient because I needed two lights and two modifiers and using the 190 centimeter softbox would have been better. Alternatively, you could use a very large umbrella. Where you position your subject is really key. If they are too close to the softbox, the light won't hit them at all. And if they're too far away, the light won't hit their left eye. So stand in their position and close your eye closest to the softbox. If you can see the white surface, with your other eye, the one closest to the camera, then that is probably a good spot for your subject to stand. Because if you can see the light, then the light can see you. 
You can use the same approach when it comes to positioning any light in any setup. Just stand in your subject's position and imagine how the light or lights are hitting them. To control the amount of hair light, or in this case, a hat light, all you have to do is move the light up or down on the stand, exposing more or less of the white surface above the black card, and this will result in a brighter or darker hat light. When photographing a bald subject, keep the stand low so none of the white surface is peeking over the top of the V-flat. And if they have matte black hair or a hat, Move it skyward until you get the right amount of light on top. For a high contrast look, you can remove the diffusion layer on the 190 centimeter octobox and point the indirect modifier directly at your subject. Feathering probably won't do much when the diffusion is removed and the light it produces is going to be high contrast yet somewhat soft due to its large size. You can use it whenever you want the feeling of sunlight, but with more pleasing skin texture. Basically, this will produce the same light that you would expect from a large silver umbrella, but better. This type of lighting is also great for black and white or sports images. For this series with Jason, I removed the diffusion and lit the background with two Allen Chrome indirect light motor strip softboxes, which are 33 by 175 centimeters. That's 13 by 69 inches. How I lit the background isn't too important. You can get the same look with two umbrellas or two lights bouncing off of V-flats. Just make sure that the light from these modifiers doesn't strike your subject. To sum it all up, there's a lot that you can do with this modifier. Whether your studio has lofty ceilings or you're in a regular room, the 190 centimeter 75 inch indirect light motif octobox is a wonderful softbox to have in your lineup and you can adapt it to work with almost any brand of lights. With its ability to replicate window light and versatility across various lighting setups, this modifier paves the way for photographers to be, well, legendary. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions or comments, please leave those below. Also, please click on the links in the description to check out this amazing softbox. I'll be teaching in-person workshops soon in DC, Chicago, Seattle, and Orlando, where you might be able to see the 190 in action. For more information, go to johngress.com workshops. Also, please check out my online members-only learning platform, The Academy with John Gress, at johngress.com academy. Thank you so much for all of your time. Have a great day and I will talk to you soon.